And a very good afternoon. My name is Joel Hufford. Welcome to this Portsmouth Water webinar on our Haven't Thicket Reservoir project. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that reminder of what the reservoir will look like once it's completed in around uh, nine years' time. Uh, welcome along this afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to join us and get an update on how the project has progressed and in particular the fact we're ready to submit our planning applications for the reservoir in the coming weeks. Just a reminder, we are recording the uh, webinar today. So if you want to watch it back after the fact or if you want to um, signpost it to colleagues or other friends and family you think may be interested, we'll send you a link so you can access that after the fact as well. And by all means, do keep your comments and questions coming into us uh, via the Q&A tool that we'll talk through very sh shortly uh, for the Zoom platform that we're using. So before we meet the panel members that you'll be hearing from today, let's have a look at what we'll be talking through in terms of an agenda for today's session. Plus, we'll show you how you can interact throughout the session as well. We want plenty of questions and comments from you, so do keep them coming in and, and we can answer them as best we can. So in terms of today's sessions, we'll get to meet the panel very shortly. And just to remind you of the key figures uh, within Portsmouth Water and the Haven't Thicket Reservoir project. I'll also give you an update on what's been going on with the scheme since the public consultation back in May and June, and also what we heard during that consultation in particular in terms of key themes. We'll talk about how that um, feedback from the consultation has been used to revise the planning applications that will go in for the reservoir project in the coming weeks. And we'll take you through the detail of that. And of course, we'll talk to you about next steps in terms of planning going in, a decision being made and subject to that being a positive decision, what happens after that in terms of the, the reservoir scheme being completed on schedule by 2029. Plus, we want plenty of your questions and your comments, as I mentioned before. Speaking of which, many of you will have used Zoom uh, many times before, I'm sure, particularly during the lockdown phase of the coronavirus situation. But just a reminder, if it's been a while since you've used it or you've not used it before, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see those two buttons there, one for raising your hand and one for asking a question. It's that question and answer button we want you to concentrate on. So if we see it in a little bit larger form, if you hit that button, you can type in a question or a comment to us. It will pop up uh, in front of me and uh, my fellow panel members as well. So we can either answer it by typing you an answer back, which again, everyone else who's viewing today will be able to see. Uh, and also as well, we can answer them by just taking part in a discussion between the panel members. The reason that we're not allowing people on camera or to use mics is just because there's quite a number of people attending today and it can get quite complicated. So I hope you appreciate that the Q&A tool is an effective way of you guys getting in touch with us and we can have a bit of a back and forth via the discussion as well. So in terms of interactivity, one thing we're going to be doing as well is uh, getting in touch with you in terms of polls. Let's launch the initial poll. So this is the same as before, if some of you remember the webinars we did back during the public consultation. We just want to know the answers to two questions. Number one, how supportive are you of our proposals for Haven't Thicket Reservoir? And it ranges from, I think they're great, right through to, I'm not sure. And then the second question is, what are you hoping to get out of today's webinar in terms of finding out more, putting your questions and comments, hearing what others have to say, whatever it might be. So do take a few moments to um, answer those poll questions. They should be popping up on your screens in front of you very shortly. So we'll just give you a little bit of time to fill those in. Just a reminder, all the information about the reservoir scheme can be still be found on our Facebook page. So if you're on Facebook, if you search at Haven't Reservoir, that will take you to our page or online at portsmouthwater.co.uk forward slash haven't dash ticket dash reservoir. And a reminder, we we're recording the webinar, so we will send you a link to access that recording if you want to share it with uh, contacts of yours to keep them up to speed. Plus, we'll post it on the um, Portsmouth Water YouTube channel as well, so you can keep up to date on that as well. So we'll just give people a few more seconds to fill that poll in, and we'll be doing the twin of that poll at the end. So in terms of how you feel about the reservoir scheme overall, having heard about our updated proposals, and also if you found the webinar experience a useful one. So let's end the polling there, see what the results are, just share them on the screen. Again, they should pop up in front of you just in case they haven't. So in terms of answers to the first question, how supportive are you of our proposals for Haven't Thicket Reservoir? 38% uh, think they're great. Uh, another 38% think they're good. 15% uh, think they're okay. And 8%, uh, one person is not sure. And then in terms of what people want out of today's webinar, uh, most people, 70%, want to find out more about the updated proposals, particularly on the back of the feedback from that consultation in May and June. Uh, a small number of people want to put their questions directly to the Ports of Water team. Others want to hear um, what other stakeholders think. 
Uh, and also as well as a lot of people who want to know about um, what the next steps are for the project. So thanks very much for that feedback. And of course, we'll ask your polling opinions at the end of the session as well. So let's meet the uh, panel that you'll be hearing from today. So panel members, if you could turn on your cameras and your mics, and I'll just go round and just ask you to say a little bit about your role and how you're involved in the Reservoir Project. So let's start with, with Bob Taylor. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Bob Taylor, I'm the CEO of Portsmouth Water, and uh, I'm really, from our board's point of view, the person that's in overall charge and uh, an overall leadership role with the project. Thank you. Let's move on to Simon. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Simon Hughes. I'm the Stakeholder Environment and Planning Lead and uh, sort of coordinating all those aspects of the project. And then on to Malcolm. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Malcolm Orford. I'm the uh, reasonably recently appointed uh, project director for Haven't Thicket. Uh, delighted to join the project. Uh, come from a background of project delivery, most recently as the Tideway Super Surrey through central London, and of course, uh, more recently, Lower Thames Crossing. But, but this has really shown me the criticality of, uh, of really effective engagement. So I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. Thank you to Malcolm. Uh, Jim, next. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Barker. I'm the Head of Water Resources for Portsmouth Water. And it's my job to make sure water is still coming out of the taps in 100 years' time. Thank you to Jim. Uh, on to Trevor. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Trevor Codlin, the principal ecologist, um, entirely sort of leading on the, the, the Haven't Thicket project and sort of ecology related things. Uh, and then on to Joe. Hello, um, I'm Joe Farah and I'm from Atkins and leading on the uh, preparation of the planning applications. Uh, next to Bill. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Bill Irvin, I'm the lead design engineer. Uh, on the project, I work for Atkins as, uh, as well as Joe um, and help coordinate all the, the technical elements to bring the, the design together. And then last but far from least, uh, Bex. Hi, I'm Rebecca Burgess and I'm supporting on the engagement and communication around the project. So uh, these are the panel members that you can put your questions and your comments to today and we'll give you the best answers that we can. Uh, on during the webinar. Uh, if we need to, we can also uh, give you some further details in writing after the fact as well, but do keep the questions coming in. Had a couple that uh, come in already, so we'll get to those very shortly during the first Q&A, uh, but there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to make your points to the panel as we go through the day. So thanks to the panel members for now. In the meantime, let's focus on what happened uh, a few weeks ago back during the consultation in May and June on having Thicket Reservoir and our updated proposals. We've made a short film just to give you some key highlights, some key stats from how that engagement went.
So those are some of the numbers from our consultation on having thicker re reservoir back in May and June. So many thanks to everyone who took the time to give their feedback. Uh, let's reflect on that in a bit more detail with Bob uh, and also Malcolm and Simon as well. Um, Bob, if I can start with, with you first. In terms of having thicket reservoir, many people who live locally will have heard about this for decades, dating back to the 1960s. I guess as a company for Portsmouth Mortar, it must be a proud moment to be ready to, to put in a, a detailed planning application or planning applications for the reservoir and the, and the associated um, infrastructure in the coming weeks. Yes, undoubtedly, uh, Joel. Firstly, maybe before I answer that point directly maybe I can just thank everybody for connecting with the the zoom call this afternoon I mean today's call has been uh, I suppose uh, the latest in a long line of, of communications that we've had around the project uh, that shows the the level of interest and the um, and the desire for for our community uh, and stakeholders to get involved in the project so um, I think the recent consultation has again illustrated that but yeah I'm, I'm really proud that we're in a position to uh, we're ready to submit the planning application there have been a couple of false starts in the past but um, this is a great project for our local community particularly in the context of what's happening in the wider world with with COVID challenges and so on um, and I'm really pleased that this time it's a go and in terms of things that have happened since the public consultation as well as obviously the work to put the revised planning cap planning application together take all that feedback into account help update the proposals that will go forward to have borough council and east hampshire district council in due course there's been progress on other fronts particularly um, the land management and the site management of having thicket reservoir as a site and the surrounding area together yeah, we've um, we've signed an MOU in conjunction with um, uh, Hans County Council and Forestry England, which is really a an illustration or, or a mechanism, I suppose, for the three organisations to collaborate uh, and discuss the way that the land will be uh, will be used in the future. So uh, they're both organisations that we've worked a lot with in the past, particularly Hans County Council, with our involvement locally in, in many other areas but it's really great to have that kind of um, outward declaration if you like that the three organizations are keen to work together and um, continue their relationship in the context of having thicket and in terms of next steps we'll reflect on those um, very shortly in, in terms of the further detail message from you as the, as the head man at Portsmouth Water is to carry on the conversation particularly with local communities and with anyone who's got an interest in the project from whatever perspective it may be yeah, we, we see ourselves very much as a community based organization. I know I've said that before and um, uh, I'm proud to say that that's that's why we exist. We're here for our customers and for our the communities that we serve. We're very, very much as a small sort of city centric company and that culture, that philosophy, that general ethos applies as much to this project and what we will deliver back to the community as as in other areas. So um, you know the dialogue is still ongoing we're always still keen to talk to people and listen to views and um, we met made a lot of new friends actually through this process of consultation uh, both locally and and further afield and um, you know I'm proud to say that we we take on take people's views very seriously um, we don't always do what people want us to do we can't please all the people all the time but if we're not able to respond to somebody's um, request or idea then we'll explain why. But in the main, um, I think, as you'll hear in a moment in terms of the detail of this consultation, we have been able to respond in a couple of uh, very, very key areas. And uh, Malcolm, if I can turn to you, just to build on what uh, Bob was saying about the progress uh, with the discussions with Hampshire County Council and Forestry England, people will have noticed, particularly if they live locally, stuff going on on the reservoir site. They may have seen activity in the roads leading down from the site down in towards Haven Town Centre. Can you explain a bit about what work's been going on as, as part of the, um, the preparation for the project? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's for, for those of you who've been lived around the site for a great number of years, there's been a huge amount of work already done. But there were some areas where we really wanted to do some even more investigation work and there's no there's no other better alternative than to really open up the ground and see what's there so that's what we did on the actual haven't thicket site itself we opened up some pretty sizable excavations to really see firsthand exactly what what the ground conditions are i'm pleased to say they were exactly as we expected in fact in some instances they were actually marginally better and it just really reinforces what what a, what a great site the, the, the location is 
In terms of the pipeline, what we've been doing is we've been doing GPR surveys. So this is the radar that we've run across the surface, the surface of the ground, just to tell us exactly where those services are. Uh, so we can really be confident that when we've got that pipeline route, which will include an application, we really know it's the right route and we've got, got that confidence that it's, uh, it's a, a scheme that we can deliver successfully. Okay, thanks very much. And then Simon, uh, I think we've got a slide that has got a bit more information on it, but can you just take us through the sort of main themes you had in terms of feedback from the consultation? Because they fitted broadly into four or five different different pots in terms of the, the key key points that people tend to make. Yeah, thanks, Joel. And just, just before I do, I just want to pay tribute to this forum uh, and those of you on the call and those of you who've come to the various meetings over the years. Um, you, you've been in it for over a decade. Um, you've been an incredible, uh, powerful force for good, and you have shaped our planning application very comprehensively. So thank you so much for, for that. We, we couldn't be here without you, um, and there's plenty more to come. Um, so just to touch on, a, uh, on the five themes that, um, that came out of the consultation, and, and hopefully by now you'll have received your copy of the um, You Said We Did report, which gives you all of the detail um, of the, uh, uh, the feedback that we've had. There, there were five overarching themes. The first one was around the, the sorts of community facilities that, were, that we'd include and would be available. So that's things like the visitor centre, the paths and cycle routes and bridle ways, um, the car parking, whether or not there would be angling, uh, boating, wild swimming, and so on. And again, we'll, we've we've touched on those in some significant detail in the report, and we'll uh, we'll cover um, our response to those issues um, uh, uh, later on in this in this webinar. Um, on the reservoir access road, we've had uh, a, mi a mix of views across the introduction of a southern route uh, alongside the northern route. Um, and uh, the sort of various pros and cons of, um, of, of introducing that new route. But one of the principal ones there was about making sure that we don't create a rat run uh, so, such that people use it to access uh, or dodge traffic. And uh, I can reassure you absolutely that that will not be possible uh, through both the design of the roads and the way that they terminate into the site and also the way the sites access to the sites manage the vehicles. Um, the route of the reservoir pipeline has uh, has come up as a, as an issue, and we've um, what what we've aimed to do there is to ensure that um, there's as much flexibility as possible around the reservoir pipeline. Because despite the the, the very intensive um, investigations of the route, until you dig, you can't be 100% sure of what's there. So we've introduced as much flexibility as we can. But what we've also been able to do is to make sure that we're not impacting on any homes, um, any businesses, any buildings, and also any sensitive environmental sites. So we're not going to have, a, have an impact on any, any uh, woodland, which is uh, really good. The, um, obviously the loss of the ancient woodland on site has, has been a, a, a major aspect, and there's a very comprehensive uh, treatment of that, again, in the report, and we'll touch on that. Um, uh, myself and Trevor in a moment, so I won't go into detail on that. But um, again, a lot of a, a lot of feeling about the loss of the woodland uh, and the creation of of new woodland, um, and a lot of very helpful ideas as well around how we can uh, how we can manage that. Um, many of which we've been able to take on on board. And then finally, the 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 plan to deliver the overall benefit to the environment around biodiversity net gain benefits from the wetland, benefits for birds, um, plants and uh, insects and, um, uh, and, and so on, and bats as well in particular. So, you know, a very good range of um, feedback. Really, really thank you and, uh, uh, and those who've responded. You've, you've shaped our submission uh, and you've helped make it better. So uh, thanks very much. Got a couple of questions that have come in via the Q and A tool, so do keep those comments and questions coming in. Just hit that button and type it in. A couple of people saying they've got some issues with sounds and background music that's interfering. It's not something I'm picking up, but if you are, apologies for that. And I'd suggest if you log out and come back into the webinar, it tends to resolve these things. It's not hopefully going to come out on the recording. So if you've missed a bit because of that background noise, 
you should be able to play the recording back and pick up on it. Uh, Bob, I've got, a, I've got a question in from Sue James, who's interested in what jobs are going to be created via the reservoir scheme and whether we've got plans to offer training and if so, in any particular area. So I know that's something you're very passionate about is that in terms of the, the reservoir project, creating as much job opportunities, training, really leaving a legacy for the local community. Yeah, I mean, we as a business, we pride ourselves on growing our own when it comes to our our staff and our talent. We tend to take a lot of people on at an early, relatively early age in their careers as teenagers or or fresh from university and um, and, and stay with the company, provide further training and, um, uh, and experience as needed and, and people stay with us. So uh, that also extends to the project. Uh, I mean, we <laughs> this is a... Uh, a one, one in a million project for us as a business so uh, we're, we obviously get our people in the engineering side of the business involved with the project so that they can learn from uh, projects at a scale uh, like this which is way bigger than the sort of um, investment projects that we would normally have but um, in terms of the supply chain we are going to be uh, asking uh, we haven't started the, the the procurement process yet we've been sounding out uh, potential bidders on the market. So um, one of the requirements is for, for the contractors that are successful to use uh, local subcontractors and local um, uh, local people as much as they possibly can. And in addition to that, we have strong links with our local colleges for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, there is one particular local college that specializes in construction. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for us to show you know, heavy earth moving construction activity to showcase that to the students at that um, uh, at that technical college and um, uh, and get them in, involved in wider ways. So, yeah, we're training and development of, of staff and people within the local community uh, is very important to us. We hope that will have a positive immediate benefit for us as a company, but certainly we're hoping that it will have a community benefit again, particularly in the current economic circumstances. Okay, thank you to Bob. Uh, and Simon, a question uh, to you from James Farrell, who, if memory serves you rightly, is the chair of the Friends of Stoughton Country Park. James asks, how accurate and realistic is the artist's impression in the video regarding the link to Stoughton Country Park, which I think is where people see the staircase going up the embankment again, if, if my memory is correct? Yeah, hi, James. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your question. Um, and, and thanks also to uh, Storm Country Park and the team there have been uh, yeah, just a, a, a brilliant uh, ally in this project. Um, yeah, so that um, those steps that you can see going up the embankment are actually a really important piece of our um, mitigation of our impact on the historic environment because it's a continuation of, of the walk from um, the avenue. So it's, it's part of uh, um, the way that the project can respect the, that um, those those sort of uh, access lines and the routes on the maps and the viewpoints um, by creating that uh, very sort of feature embankment uh, um, element, um, such that people could then walk up to the top of the embankment and see the line of where, of where the embankment, the sorry, the uh, avenue would have would have continued and see how the route sort of continues because it does continue off up into Haven Thicket, um, the Forest of England land. So uh, yes, that's a, that's a deliberate um, design feature. And whilst it might not look absolutely exactly like that, it's certainly a very, very close representation of it. In terms of, you might've seen the visitor center um, on, on the uh, video, that at the moment, that's, um, uh, that's only been designed to sort of outline what we call Reba stage two. So very outline, which is sort of set the size, the type of rooms that would be in it, sorts of materials that, that would be used to build it but not the detailed design so the visitor center is purely a, an impression of what it I think Simon might have frozen there, so I'll, I'll pick up from him. We've had a, a couple of more questions in, one coming in from Pat Brooks, who I think is from Haven't Friends of the Earth. Pat, we've got that question, I think it's part of the other questions that you've asked, so we'll pick on that, up on that in a, a little bit more detail in due course. Many thanks to Bob, uh, to Simon, hopefully we'll be back soon, and to Malcolm as well. We'll hear from them further throughout the webinar. Let's move on to the next section now. Uh, we're going to show you a film just to set the context of this next section, which is discussing how the planning application has been shaped by the feedback we received during the consultation. So let's play that film and we'll come back to the discussion with, with Simon, hopefully, and certainly Trevor Codlin as well.
We're delighted here at Portsmouth Water to have submitted a planning application to build the first new reservoir in the UK since the 1980s. It's a landmark moment as Havensickett Reservoir was first mooted back in the 1960s. Havensickett Reservoir would be built on the 160 hectares of land we already own, which sits in between Staunton Country Park, Havensickett Woodland, Rowlands Castle and Warren Park and Lee Park. It would measure one mile long by half a mile wide and would be up to 18 metres deep, holding 8.7 billion litres of water when it's full. That's enough to supply about 160,000 people each day for a year. The reservoir would be filled from the prolific Havant and Bedhampton Springs during winter, when spare water usually flows out to sea. It would take two years to plan and carry out preparatory work followed by four years to build and then three years to fill the reservoir with water, meaning it would be finished, operational and fully open to the public by 2029. Havensickett Reservoir would bring many benefits to the area, including much needed water supplies for the water-stressed southeast. We'd share supplies with our neighbours, Southern Water, to protect Hampshire's rare chalk streams from having too much water taken from them in particular, the River Itchin and River Test. The reservoir would be a great place for leisure for local communities to boost physical and mental well-being. Its creation would also mean opportunities for jobs, education, training and learning more about nature. Plus, there'd be a unique opportunity to create a new large wetland for wildlife located on the reservoir's northern edge. The reservoir scheme would provide a significant opportunity to create and improve hundreds of acres of native and valuable woodland and grassland in the local area. The site, as it is at the moment, would change, and we're committed to creating a great place for communities and wildlife that's tranquil, supports nature, and secures vital water supplies for people, business, and the environment long into the future. Our approach to developing the reservoir has the environment and the community at its heart. We've worked really closely with local communities and environmental organisations for many years to consider nature and wildlife in every part of the design, and will continue to do so. Developing the reservoir would mean the loss of about 12 hectares of ancient woodland on the site. We studied more than 70 other sites to see if there was a better alternative for the reservoir to be built, with the location selected being the best overall. And we've managed to reduce the number of trees that would need to be taken out by changing the design of the reservoir. We can't replace this ancient woodland, but instead we can make sure we take this opportunity to create a really positive legacy for our local environment and wildlife, while ensuring there's enough water for all in the decades ahead. In our planning application, we'll commit to create a 10 hectare wetland on the north side of the reservoir to support threatened bird species and help threatened bat species find food, with islands, reed beds and wet woodland to create a variety of habitats. We'll also restore more than 100 hectares of woodland, including ancient woodland, for example, in Forestry England's neighboring Haven't Thicket woodland. Plant new broadleaf woodland around the reservoir We've already planted 6,000 trees on site, including creating a memorial woodland with Havant Borough Council. And we'd create up to 80 hectares of new lowland wood pasture in partnership with an environmental organisation. Through the reservoir project, we'll also improve the water quality and flow in the riders and hermitage streams in Havant. And we'd set up a grant scheme to support local wildlife projects in Hampshire and West Sussex. Plus, our work won't stop there. When the reservoir is built, we plan to manage the site, Haven Thicket Woodland and Staunton Country Park as one area in partnership with Forestry England and Hampshire County Council.
So that was a, a sneak preview of a suite of films that we're making for when the planning applications for Heaven Thicket Reservoir go in, just to keep everyone updated on what the project's about, and in particular how it's um, changed in terms of the proposals uh, based on what people told us during that um, consultation back in May and June. Let's explore that in a little bit more detail with Simon Hughes, who should hopefully be back with us, and also Trevor Codlin as well, uh, our chief um, environmentalist on the project. Um, and Trevor, if, if I could start with you, um, there's been a lot of concern about the, the ancient woodland on the site, and I guess it's, it's worth reminding people, and we touched upon it in that video there, just how many sites were looked at for the reservoir to go to meet that need in the wider southeast of, of water resources and security for the future uh, versus mm -hmm. um, you know, what the impact <clears throat> might be on a local site. So it was quite a number of sites that were looked at before having thick it was selected as the, the appropriate site. Yeah, so initially it was um, it was over 70 sites were screened and um, they were screened using a, a, some set criteria about, you know, whether there's the viability of the site um, being, being, being able to be used as a reservoir and that obviously takes into account the substrate. Um, we then um, sort of took it forward and came out with another five sites and, um, and those sites were looked at in even more detail. And one of the main criteria for this was that there had to be a flow of water to enable um, the reservoir to be filled. And, um, and so of those um, five sites, uh, one of them actually was, it was almost sort of like, well, I think it's 100% woodland, so it would have been an even greater loss of woodland. So we've, um, we've actually chosen this site mainly due to the size, it provides us enough water for what is required. Um, the environmental constraints were, were, were sort of the lower of all the sites we looked at generally. And the substrate is really good clay under the site. And, um, and so um, moving that on one stage further, we then looked at various options within the site. So we looked at having several smaller reservoirs. So for example, you could try and save the avenue and, um, and have two smaller reservoirs either side or three smaller reservoirs. Um, we, we sort of put those proposals to the stakeholder group because we've had a, a stakeholder group for uh, many years sort of feeding into this. And um, there, there are several reasons why you can't do that, but it, essentially one, it wouldn't give us enough water. Two, the best clay that we need to build the embankments for the reservoir are under the avenue. So you wouldn't be able to access that, that clay. And if you did save the avenue with, and had two reservoirs either side, that, that reservoir would, well, the, the woodland, remaining woodland, and would be set below the height of the embankments so it just really wouldn't be healthy um, for the woodland and it would become very wet and flooded um, pretty much during the winter all the time. And can you tell us a little bit more about what the plan is um, under the reservoir scheme? So it's 12 and a half hectares of ancient woodland that would be affected but there's a big plan to deliver an overall benefit to the environment through the scheme in terms of a much wider area in terms of hectares of woodland that would be either created or restored again creating you know new havens for wildlife and, and that sort of thing yeah so it's so if we just look at the woodland to start with so we've been liaising with natural england and and other partners throughout and um and we've looked at the the area of woodland that we've got um, initially we've tried to um, maintain as much of the woodland as we can so the embankment for argument's sake has um you know, we, we've moved the, the, the downward slope of the reservoir from a one in seven to a one in five. So essentially it's going to be a steeper slope where it crosses the woodland. Um, so therefore we're able to save more woodland at the base of the avenue and also round wood. Um, and the Corsican pine plantation at the northern end, edge of the site, so it's actually just off the avenue, which is a plantation uh, woodland of Corsican pine. What, what that's going to uh, change into is a wet woodland so that that will actually be situated within our new wetland and so we're going to take out the coarse pine but plant that with sort of willow and alder car so that will be more of a, a natural sort of flooded woodland and so that leaves us with the loss of the sort of middle clearing and the main bits of the avenue and um, we sort of worked um, sort of quite quite heavily on this and um, because it's one of the key issues and so we're looking at uh, well, we've already done two areas of planting on site, which is um, areas of Gypsies Plain and Deer Slaughter Plain, where we planted um, around about 6,000 trees. Unfortunately, due to the environmental conditions this year, some of those trees have died. So we'll be replacing those this winter. And, um, and those trees, um, we've had some questions on that, but those trees will be looked after in perpetuity. This is our, our site, it's our asset, and we intend to look after it um, you know, for, the, for the future. Um, we're looking at... Um, creating um, an area of wood pasture uh, to the tune of around about 80 hectares 
now what what we sort of thought about with this is like on our site we've got plantation woodlands and what we wanted to try and do is not just to sort of create another the plantation woodland but actually create something that's more natural and there's a lot of talk around wilder and um, sort of making the habitats more wild going forward and so so what we're doing we're sort of going into partnership with um with, with an environmental organization to create 80 hectares of wood pasture so this is hopefully one block um, a, a woodland that will do some uh, standard tree planting to start with but then we'll let it develop naturally and uh, there'll be um, livestock grazing in there and we'll let it go through the various phases of scrub development and woodland development so it doesn't look like a plantation it will have a very natural feel to it and that's that's really exciting and we're proposing to fund that um, for the long term and then we're also working with Forestry England to create um, sort of in, enhance the woodlands in, in Haven't Thicket because again that's generally plantation woodland and a lot of it is secondary birch woodland which isn't particularly species rich or sort of diverse so the plan is um, to manage that and open up woodland rides and clearings and sort of do some again some native tree planting and sort of bring it back to a more semi-natural woodland rather than the sort of plantation woodlands that it is at the moment. And um, and then we're sort of still looking at other areas. So obviously the water courses, um, you know, we're losing some ephemeral streams on the site. So we're looking at doing um, some enhancements to the Hermitage stream and trying to sort of re-naturalize the Hermitage stream. Um, the wetland, uh, you know, that's a very exciting bit of the project, which I think is, is going to be really, really exciting. Um, we're also looking, going back to woodland again, actually there's another area of woodland that we're looking at restoring as well. Another plantation woodland, um, about 70 hectares in size. Um, that we're looking at restoring that from plantation woodland to more natural woodland as well. So lots of very exciting projects going forward. Okay, thank you tre to Trevor for that comprehensive roundup. Uh, Simon, if I can turn to you, we've had quite a number of questions in from Pat Barker, I think it is, from uh, Haven't Climate Alliance and Haven't Friends of the Earth. I'll put some of them uh, to Trevor and, and Pat, we will get back to you with written answers with a bit more detail, but I've just tried to group them around so we can just get through the key themes today on the, the Q&A on the webinar. And one of... Uh, Pat's question, Simon, is around uh, commitment to manage the site in the long term. Uh, so she asks, all the woodlands, wetlands, wildlife and wildflower areas within the reservoir site will need to be managed and maintained in perpetuity as an obligation to the people of Haven and East Hampshire. Is Portsmouth Water committed to funding this, um, possibly in conjunction with other authorities? Uh, and she's also talking about not everything can be done by volunteers, because I know that's a, a big part of the community involvement side of things. How many permanent jobs do you intend to create to support this work and benefit the local economy? So the uh, thanks, Pat. Um, the answer to your first question is yes, absolutely, without question. It's uh, how Portsmouth Water wants to work, and it's how Portsmouth Water has promised it will work, and it's made that promise not just to its regulators, uh, uh, the regulators who are overseeing the, our development of our proposals, uh, but also to, to our customers. So yes, 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 yes. Um, in terms of uh, how that actually works and how that looks, so Bob talked about the MOU that's been signed with um, Forest England and, uh, uh, and Hampshire County Council. That is, um, that is to set out an agreement to the uh, long-term management of the three sites as one. Um, and um, it really begins that conversation as to how we come about uh, an arrangement to run the entirety of those, three, of those three sites to deliver benefits to the environment that you wouldn't get if you didn't join um, each of those different types of habitat together. But also so that if a visitor goes to Snorted Country Park, or to Forestry England, or to Porter Site, they get the same experience. They get um, the same type of quality, the same type of branding, the same pop up charges, you know, all it's all uh, uh, an equivalent uh, experience. And it also means that one is not competing against the other, which is very, very important for Ports of Water as a, uh, uh, to fulfill its mission of being a good neighbor as well as being a good uh, custodian of the environment. In terms of numbers of jobs, um, it's a really difficult one to answer this um, because yes, there'll be a core team within the visitor center running the kitchen and the cafe and the visitor experience. And you could be 
you know, between three and five core people there. Then there'll be people supplying the site. There'll be people working on the site to maintain it. Uh, and I agree, you can't do it all by volunteers. You can do quite a lot, but you can't do it all by volunteers. Then there'll be the arrangements around um, the long-term woodland creation that Trevor talked about. Again, you know, that will create jobs, pay jobs for people to work on those uh, sites, even though they're, they are most likely remote from the physical reservoir site. So we had, a, um, we had a, a, an assessment done called a, 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 a natural capital assessment of projects. And that talked about you know, tens of jobs, sort of 50 to 100 jobs being created in its entirety around this site. I think if you looked at what, what, what are the specific numbers, there'll be a team of um, three to five working in the visitor center, then there'll be um, you know, one or two folk um, leading on the, the management of the site, and then teams of up to 40 volunteers working on various, various different aspects, plus all of the additional benefits out into the wider, uh, the wider economy for, you know, folk running the sandwich vans when the, when the construction teams are on site and, and so on. So very difficult question to answer, which is why I've got, given you a long rambling one, sorry. But. Yeah, but I think the, the, the main message from Bob was just to carry on the conversation, we'll stay in touch. And I think the main thing is to get as much community input into, into the proposal as possible. Sorry, Trevor, you were going to say? Yeah, I was just going to say with regard, to obviously, there's been previous mention of training and things like that as well. And, um, and I've had some good discussions with both Forestry England and Hampshire County Council. And, um, you know, one of, one of the things that will be important from a biodiversity point of view is to monitor the species that, um, you know, when, when the changes occur and see how things things change over time. And so I've, I've been talking to them about setting up a training program to train up volunteers and staff um, for because some species, for example, dormouse and bats, you need a, a protected species license to be able to work on those. And so we're looking at sort of setting up um, you know, for, for the staff and, and, and any, any volunteers that want to sort of help get involved in monitoring things to, to sort of get their licenses towards sort of surveying for those species. So there's lots of, of different ideas that we've got coming forward. Okay, Trevor, I've got a couple more questions for you. Uh, just add a bit of feedback that we're still getting one or two sound problems. So again, if you are experiencing that, log out of the webinar, log back in, you should be able to get in just fine. And nine times out of 10, that tends to cure it. If it's, if it's um, not working, the recording that I've kind of got going through my headphones hasn't got that feedback on it. So you should be able to watch it back after the fact. So apologies, but I think it's one of the vagaries of the internet and of the Zoom age that occasionally you get gremlins in the work. So uh, Trevor, before we move on to the access road with Simon, just one more question on the woodland from Pat. And essentially we've got four questions that I'll reply to separately and write a bit. It essentially boils down to, how many actual trees are you losing in terms of ancient woodland and what will be going back in? So Pat is wanting to know about that in terms of actual trees. So is, is that the right way to look at things? Well, we, 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 we don't want to look at it as in terms of tree numbers, because if you look at some of the woodlands we've got on site, they're plantation woodlands. And so the trees are planted really closely together. And that means that you don't have any understory. So it's not really any good for biodiversity. I mean, yes, it has some value. Um, so what we're looking at is areas, so it's actual coverage. So um, and 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 then the areas that we're creating, we want to create. I mean, given the the differences and the size that we're actually dealing with here, we are going to be planting more trees than we're losing, but we don't want them to come out looking like plantations. We want them to be really good wildlife sites. Be because you know we're displacing some species from the site particularly bats and, and dormice and we want to make sure that the habitats that we're creating are really beneficial for those species okay thank you to trevor so if i can turn back to you we've got a slide now with the access route options on which is the same as the map that people may recognize from the public consultation another key theme of the um planning application in terms of it evolving is we've changed our thinking around the access route option. So do you just want to give people the key details on that and the rationale for it? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Joel. And um, so Trevor talked, uh, talked before about um, us being able to shift the, the alignment of the embankment slightly to protect uh, ancient woodland. Um, what, what we've also looked really hard at was the, the the access route coming in from the B2149 to the north, because that also comes through ancient woodland. And if we were to create um, a, a road of the of, of the size required for it to be the sole access, we we would be losing some um, 
so, some uh, additional ancient woodland there. So by moving the embankment slightly, the sort of um, western edge of the embankment where it's sort of next to the orange line that you can see on that map there, um, we were able to move it inwards slightly towards the main body of the reservoir and free up a bit of space that would allow us both to create sufficiently wide uh, and accessible pedestrian um, paths, cycling paths and footways and bridle paths, uh, and also fit in um, a, an access route for vehicles. That gives us a, a, another option uh, then, which we consulted on um, and got some really helpful views on. Um, and so we're including that in our planning application as a, as a new Southern access. What this means is that we can um, manage uh, those two access points um, such that traffic is, is um, sort of split, spread across the two, the two routes into and out of the reservoir site. Um, one of the points that came up, I think I mentioned it earlier, is, is just making sure that, that doesn't turn into a rat run because if you're a, if you're a, a hasty commuter and um, the, uh, the A3 is closed, uh, you might see that as, a, oh, that's a great alternative route. Well, absolutely not, it won't be. Uh, we're able to put in place um, access management measures. Both of the roads will terminate in a car park. Um, there is absolutely no way that that is ever going to become a rat run through the, through the measures that we put in place. Um, I'd also just reflect on the fact that um, vehicle access to the site will be controlled. Uh, it won't be uh, free access 24 hours a day. There will be um, gates and barriers to make sure that access is a vehicle access is only available um, either for emergencies or when um, there, are, there's, there's, there are supervisors on site and staff on site. So that gives us a, 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 another option. It allows us to dilute the, um, the amount of traffic going into and off the site. And um, I'd, I'd encourage you to have a look at the, some of the um, material on our, on, our, on our application, which, which sort of shows the models of the numbers of vehicles that we're expecting to, to access and, and um, come from the site. And it's, it's uh, pretty low, even in its highest uh, periods, it's, um, it's a pretty low traffic rate. Uh, and that's a really cool thing to, to remind ourselves of that, um, Actually, we're designing this reservoir principally for quiet enjoyment of the countryside with opportunities for learning. And that's one of the reasons why we're not proposing to put um, a lot of boating on the site, for example, or allow wild swimming, or allow anything actually that draws in additional numbers of visitors over and above what we've, what we've forecast would be the demand for access to a lovely site with a good quality visitor centre and some opportunities to learn. So we're actively managing the, the, um, the, the draw of the reservoir to make sure that the, reservoir, the, the, the traffic into the reservoir site is, uh, is both manageable and doesn't have an impact on the surrounding roads and communities. Okay, thank you to Simon. Just a quick update on if you've been having sound problems. Uh, the boffins behind the scene have been having a look at it and they think if, it may be that you've effectively got Zoom open twice. Once in the app that might be on your phone or your computer and once in a separate web browser. So if you have had that sound issue, close the web browser and it should cut out the dual sound that you're getting. Um, back to the changes in the planning application, Simon. A couple of other things that have changed. There's a five kilometre network of paths for pedestrians, cyclists, horse riders, joggers to use around the site. Those paths are going to be made wider. Uh, is there a particular reason for that? Yeah, so we, we, um, we heard from um, a, a, range of, uh, a, a range of you on the, on the call, thank you, um, and others who just sort of asked us to reflect on the conflict between um, users, different users of the paths, and just making sure that we are able to take the opportunity at this stage to design those conflicts out. Um, and fortunately, again, by, by having a, uh, the opportunity to sort of shift things around, we're, um, we're able to create um, those, those wider paths, which will, um, our experts advise us, will, will remove significantly remove those opportunities for um, 
cyclists to ride into pedestrians to rook to scare the horses uh, as it were but at the same time just making sure that and, and this is really important to us making sure that all of the paths are accessible to um, people who need uh, special accessibility um, uh, facilities in place as well so um, having a bit more space has allowed us to do designing those those deconflictions but also those additional benefits for those who use who, who have special needs Okay, uh, Trevor, got a couple of questions for you that have come in uh, via the Q and A tool. Uh, so again, keep on timing those questions in. Uh, one from Simon Oakley, who says, "Where would the soils from the ancient woodland being lost be relocated and perhaps reused? Is is that something that's possible?" Yeah. <clears throat> so the um, the soils under Middle Clearing and Round Wood are um, are essentially not ancient woodland soils. They're um, they're more akin to an agricultural grassland. So we've got no plans to to salvage those soils. There's no ancient woodland indicators in them. Um, um, so really focusing on the soils in the avenue, um, those, those soils um, will, will be removed um, where, where it's sort of practical to do so. And yes, we'll, we'll try and use those in, in other areas where we're creating woodland. Okay, thank you to Trevor. And uh, Councillor Francis, I think was having a few issues with the sound, but she's back with a vengeance now with plenty of questions, Simon. So I'll just fire them at you. Uh, she asks, are you still thinking of floating solar panels at all on the reservoir at any stage in the future? Hi, Beryl. Thank you for your questions, um, uh, and and good to hear from you. Yes, yes, we're we're looking at the options for um, limited uh, floating panels, but absolutely. Um, we're also looking at um, what we could do with um, with and around the visitor centre as well to make sure that, um, that that not only is it as efficient as it can be, but also that there are opportunities to generate power. And there's some really interesting ideas coming forward around how you can use the differential in temperatures that, that a reservoir would, would create to um, generate energy that you can then feed back into your system. So not just, not just um, floating photovoltaic cells, but also other options as well. And then uh, she's also asked at the other end of the scale in terms of things that float on the reservoir, might there be provision for a model boat club? Yeah, so we've, we've been very clear that um, we don't, think that um, we, we want facilities for uh, full-scale boats. Um, we are examining the possibilities of a, of a model boat club, provided it could work within certain constraints and, um, and so on. I do think that um, there's a major design changes that we need to make for that, but we're certainly in dialogue with, um, with, with folk who are much more knowledgeable about these things than I am. Um, to, to help us uh, come to a conclusion and you know provided that it doesn't compromise that overall objective of quiet enjoyment of the countryside with opportunities for learning and is not driving a significant additional um, visitor numbers or a traffic load then yes something we're very keen to look at. Now we, we had a question in from Mike at Cycling UK and Mike we will get back to you in writing with a more detailed answer to all your questions as they go into some some level of detail but Mike makes the point around in the you said we did feedback report we've talked about the fact that we've heard the views from people with their concerns about antisocial behavior particularly illegal riding of motorbikes on the site being a problem both now and perhaps into the future as well so we've talked about measures to combat that in terms of limiting access or as far as you can for motorbikes to the site Mike makes the point that then may create issues in terms of access to the site for people in wheelchairs, mobility scooters or, or other users. So can you just talk about how you're going to address that balance of making the site as accessible for all as possible, but without allowing people that are going to do antisocial things on site, easy access as well? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. I think, um, I think the first point to make is that the site's nature will be very different once it's uh, once it's developed very very different in the level of sort of presence of of, um, uh, of the site owner on site you know there'll be there'll be uh, staff on site there'll be regular and frequent operational teams inspecting the, the asset and maintaining it and and operating it so it will it will look and feel a little bit different from 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 how it currently is and that it's in itself will have um certainly from uh experience of of other sites and from the experience we're picking up from colleagues at hampshire county council and forest Trinkenden who who run sites like this all the time um their advice is that 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 changing nature will be 
um, really quite influential in, in the level and scope and scale of the antisocial behaviour on site. I think there's a specific question around the type of gates that you can use that both allow accessibility um, and prevent access of, of um, uh, uh, un unlicensed uh, motorcycles. Um, and that's a conundrum we're going to have to face and we'll, we'll find a way um, because we, we cannot have illegal motorcyclists using the site and we cannot exclude uh, people who use accessibility uh, equipment to, to, to get onto the site as well. So absolutely commit to making sure that we come to the right solution on that. Um, and if that gate uh, that you may have seen a picture of isn't the right solution, we'll find a new one. We'll, we'll find the right one. And I think the point that Mike makes in his question is, in fact, in fact, if the area is well used, there's lots of people using it for biking and jogging and what have you, then that, in many ways, is the best way of combating antisocial behaviour because it means that there's going to be people around, possibly calling the police, etc., that's going to put people off doing naughty things, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. There will be a lot of people around. There'll be volunteers working on site. There'll be ports of water, forestry, the Hampshire County Council staff on site. There'll be people in the visitor centre. There'll be visitors themselves um, who are there. Um, and, you know, you know there'll be a, a light touch um, monitoring of the site in terms of the sort of... The, the, there are going to be parts of the site that people can't go on to because they're operational. Um, and there they, they will be the right level of monitoring of those sites as well, uh, either remotely or through people working on them. Okay, we've got the last few questions to get through before we kind of wrap things up and talk about next steps. So Trevor, going back to Pat's questions from Haven't Friends of the Earth and Havoc Climate Alliance, she's touched upon the fact that you know, the, 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 the prolonged spell of hot weather that we had this year has affected some of those trees that were planted on those two sites that you talked about. Can you just talk about the plans to replant some of those trees that have been affected by the heat and what the plan is for managing that moving forward just making sure the trees are looked after appropriately yeah so this year was um well they, they, you know obviously it was one of the wettest february's on record followed by one of the driest mays on record and um you know unfortunately the trees um for the phase two planting certainly were planted quite late in the season and uh, they were only planted in sort of february time so that didn't really give them a lot of time to establish and so a lot of them have died and some of the trees in the in the phase one planting area have also died some of those aren't due to the bad weather unfortunately one of the local residents down the gypsies plain end had a had a party and set off a firework which landed in in, in our ground and it's burnt um, a whole section of trees which we've now got to replace which is is very disappointing because it's sort of you know those those trees have been in there a year and a half and um but anyway, our, our plan, you know, it's a long term commitment. We're not just going to manage them for two, three, four years. You know, this is part of um, of the site and, and part of the sort of the mitigation and compensation that we're putting in around the site. And um, so it's, you know, it will form part of the management plan that we're currently drawing up to, to cover the whole area. So um, and say so certainly we, we're already working on uh, we've got prices worked up for replacing those trees. So we'll be ordering those trees as soon as we're able to and get those in this autumn. Now, another question from Pat Simon turning to you is about nitrates. So um, you can talk about it in a bit more detail because ha actually having Thicket Reservoir will have a benefit for Langston Harbour in terms of nitrate load because the water that would ordinarily go out to sea will go into the reservoir for storage instead. Pat's area of concern is are we going to do anything as in, is Portsmouth Water going to do anything with the water when it's in the reservoir to take the nitrates out of it before it goes into supply? Yeah, thanks, Pat. I mean, the brilliant thing about um, reservoirs is they do it all for you. Um, so simply taking the water from the springs, pumping it into the reservoir and letting it sit there um, is a really effective way of, of removing uh, an amount of nitrate from the water. Um, so in that regard, you know, other than the day-to-day, month-to-month management of the quality of the water in the reservoir, there'll be, there'll be, um, this is getting quite technical now, but there'll be mechanisms in, in, in the reservoir to make sure that water mixes um, and, stays, uh, and, and stays at its best quality all the way through its life cycle there. The, the nitrates will get captured by algae and other creatures some of it will sink to the bottom and and form a layer of silt in there which you know will take a process that goes on for hundreds and hundreds of years um, so actually just the water sitting in the in the reservoir itself is is good for nitrates it removes nitrate from it 
Then um, there's some additional treatment that, um, that, that we're putting in place for the water that comes out of the reservoir. And that's to make sure that those lake type algae that form um, populations there that are capturing the nitrates then get taken out of the water before it then goes into its treatment for, um, for drinking. So that is an active process that, um, that will be part of the water treatment. And then of course, you know, Forced Water, like every other water company, has some very, very stringent water quality regulations that it has to meet. And I'm pleased to say that Forced Water has got a really good track record in, in meeting and exceeding those standards. And they're set out in the drinking water safety plans. They're regulated by the drinking water inspectorate. And, you know, they are absolutely core to um, the way that the water company operates. And they themselves will set uh, minimum standards for levels of, of nitrate in drinking water, which, you know, will, which is very, very low, I have to say. Um, uh, and Portsmouth Water will meet them. Yeah. And just to go back a step, nitrates come from fertilizer, for example, from agricultural lands. If they get into Langston Harbour in too high a quantity, it causes algal blooms. It's not good for the water quality and the yeah. wildlife there. It could cause a problem in drinking uh, drinking water as well, unless you can treat it to take it out. So, again, it's um, it's it's not unique to this area, but it, it is an issue that needs to be, needs to be addressed. A um, couple more questions that have been coming in by the Q and A tool. John Davis Simon asked, "Will there be any CCTV monitoring on the site once it's completed?" Going back to that antisocial behaviour debate. Yeah. So. Um in in some places there will be yes john um the the, the every water company has a, a a requirement to meet some minimum security standards for sites like this uh and those do involve a degree of remote sensing and a degree of supervision and a degree of physical barriers as well to prevent people getting on to you know operational aspects so pumps and uh, control houses and so on um a lot of that we were able to design into the um, into the layout as, uh, at this stage. So, for example, the control house will be partially buried in the embankment. So, um, you, you, you're you're a better man than I if you can get past that um, physical security. Um, but yeah, there'll there'll be a, a light touch of um, remote uh, monitoring of the site. Um, what what we're not proposing is um, heavy fencing and barriers to the entire site. You know, people will be able to access it um, on foot and by bicycle. You know, quietly, um, pretty much twenty four hours a day. Okay, and then last question for now before we move into the final section. And again, it goes back to Councillor Francis. She makes the point. Please remember that Swanmore Road is the access road for Warren Primary School and the Shore Start Nursery. It's also residential. We would not wish to see heavy vehicles using this route during construction. And you talked about the northern and the southern access routes. And I think, if memory serves you rightly, the northern access route would be predominantly the one you could use construction traffic for. Yeah. So the construction period, absolutely right, Barrel. The 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 you know the there may be some very light traffic using the southern um, route from time to time, but the bulk of the heavy traffic for construction, I mean all of the heavy traffic for construction is intended at this stage to be using the the northern route up onto the B two or four nine. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's head into the final section then if I could ask Bob Taylor to, to pop back up on camera and Simon stay with us because you're going to talk about the, the timetable for the project moving forward uh, and Bob just to re-emphasize that, that that point in terms of the importance the landmark nature of this project being ready for the planning applications to go in to the, to the local planning authorities in the coming weeks for the reservoir itself and then for the, for the pipeline to, to fill it and to take the water out in due course yeah I mean the the um we're on the the point of being able to make the planning application so every everything is ready to to go on that and we're also on the point of being ready to um, go out to the market to begin the the procurement process we can't actually appoint anybody until we have planning permission but once we have planning permission in place i would say the project is uh, divided into three distinct phases uh, and all of them are quite heavily influenced by the natural environment. The first phase is to obviously prepare the site um, for the uh, construction work. Uh, and that involves obviously uh, a lot of the work that you've been talking about, um, you know, in, just before uh, this question uh, in terms of uh, moving the, a lot of the flora and fauna on the site into new homes and um, 
uh, preparing the, the planting activities and so on. Uh, but once, uh, and that, that is very seasonally related activity. Yeah, here we go. Here's a, a slide. Thanks, Bex, for, which sort of illustrates that program. So um, we're talking about the, uh, the early phases here, 2020, 2021 to 2023, um, all this site preparation work. And as I said, because it involves the flora and fauna on the site, then there are specific windows of activity that we need to take advantage of uh, different times of the year to do uh, very important critical path activities within that area. Um, so the next phase after that is, is the heavy construction work. Um, and there's most of that work is on site. It's it's basically an earth moving exercise to to move clay from uh, from the site from from one part of the site to another to build up the embankment. Again, the um, the construction of that embankment is is very critical. Obviously, it has to be a waterproof structure, uh, and therefore the um, the temperature and the moisture content of the clay in terms of how it's placed. In layers within the embankment again is, is quite critical and um, one of the uh, similar embankment structures that uh, one of my previous companies was uh, built a few years ago down in a place called Longham just outside Bournemouth. Um, this work had to be done in the summertime only because only then could you get the temperature and the moisture content right for the clay to be imported into the embankment and compacted um, uh, um, in the right way. Uh, so, uh, in parallel with that work on the reservoir site to build the embankment, um, there is the work on the pipelines that will happen off-site, uh, which isn't seasonally dependent, but obviously we would want to plan the activity because uh, one of the pipelines is, is, is uh, as you know, is routed through a, a large residential area. So there will be impact on local residents that we will endeavour, obviously, to keep to a, a minimum. But we want to avoid, you know, working, doing heavy excavation work outside schools when we're in term time and things like that. So um, we will do all we can to minimise the impact of that. And as you heard earlier, we've been doing some very extensive uh, underground surveys so we know exactly where all the other apparatus is and we can hopefully make sure we plan, plan the route well uh, in advance. Uh, and then once we've built the embankment and got it plumbed into our existing system, uh, the water from the reservoir comes from our Havant and Bedhampton Springs site, which is where our offices are in Havant. Um, once we've got that pipe uh, finished and plumbed into the reservoir, we then have to fill the reservoir. Um, and that depends on what surplus water is available at that site. So, you know, the whole concept of this reservoir is to use surplus spring water that we don't need as Portsmouth water for our existing customers and that water is normally available during the winter months so it depends on the sort of water resources availability situation to um, uh, to complete that last part of the program so we've got two big chunks there sort of three and a bit years for the reservoir construction and then potentially three years for the filling which are uh, are very uh, weather dependent you know with a with a um, with the following wind, we could be in a much better position in terms of timelines than the programme is showing, but um, we've taken a relatively sort of middle of the road approach in recognition of the fact that there are environmental constraints. And I guess the point to emphasise is the underlying need for having Thicket Reservoir in terms of the water resource stress across our wider region is, is growing day by day. People will have seen the impact of the weather, <laughs> climate change, population is growing. At the same time, there's a need to take less water to the environment like the rivers test and itch into to help protect them and, and maintain their sort of world-renowned status as, as chalk streams. And that's what having Thicket Reservoir is all about, is about playing a part in, in a wider regional plan to make sure there's enough water to go around. Yeah, and I would say that that kind of message has become uh, even more strongly emphasised recently, firstly because of COVID. Uh, and I think, I think different water companies have seen different impacts of COVID because the demand for water depends heavily on social patterns. But certainly in our case, we've seen a large increase in our sort of baseload domestic demand. Uh, and other companies have seen similar. That's because of people working from home, people having staycations, not, not going away on holiday and so on. So 
although non-household commercial demand in some areas has gone down, that has started to recover and is moving back to its kind of pre-COVID levels, but household demand is, is still up. So uh, we have that higher base load demand uh, coupled with uh, hot weather, weather spells like the one that we had um, in uh, August recently. So five or six days or five days, I think it was of temperatures 30 degrees and above. We haven't seen that for, for a long time. Uh, and you know the, the demand for water, not, not in terms of the resource availability, but just getting water across our system to where customers were using it uh, was, was quite a challenge. But um, yeah, in terms of the, the main purpose of this reservoir is to allow Southern to take less water from chalk streams and use water from Haven Thicket instead. And um, you know, the circumstances that we, uh, where, where that would be needed, i.e. where so the, the flows in those rivers would reduce to a level that Southern would have to stop taking water. Those, those, that, that, that situation is probably going to become uh, more of an issue rather than less of an issue as time goes on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Simon, turning to you, looking towards the, the more immediate future. The planning applications uh, will hopefully be going in in the coming weeks. Uh, what would that mean in terms of next steps? When would that come before Haven Borough Council and East Hampshire District Council's planning committees for decision in all likelihood, depending on you know, following the timetable through to 2029? Yeah, thanks, Charles. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're, as Bob said, we're, we're, um, we're ready to submit and we expect that to be coming um, you know, very, very soon. Um, obviously, then, um, colleagues in uh, Hampshire Borough Council and East Hampshire District Council will go through the process of verification to make sure that they're satisfied that everything's there. And in fact, we've been sharing documents with them over the last um, few weeks and, um, and the feedback has been very positive. So um, we'd expect verification to happen quite promptly. Um, then the, the councils will run their own consultation uh, exercise. So there's another opportunity for folk who are interested in, in um, making their views known to to do so, and I strongly encourage people to have a look on their, their websites and, and get involved, um, get involved with their, their consultation. Um, we're hopeful that um, we would be, we would see the, the application in front of committee hearings in sort of March, April of next year, which would then lead to a determination shortly after. Um, so all being well with the wind behind, um, a downhill run we'd be looking at uh, determination sort of around about early spring um, uh, 2021 and I think as Bob has said and others have said you know this although it's a 10-year project the, the time is tight um, and we're on a we're on a mission to get the reservoir completed on operational to support some of the water needs by March of 2029 and so that means we would start commencement works almost immediately that we've got um, planning consent. And that, that would be largely around creating an appropriate access route um, and then getting stuck in with the um, habitat mitigation works. So um, you know, we'd be looking to uh, implement the agreements with uh, our partner on creating new woodland, uh, working with Hampshire County Council for Australia England and improving the, the site of the woodland there. In fact, you know, we may try and and and, and um, make sure that we're ready for that sort of uh, sooner rather than later. Um, uh, uh, so, yep. So, as soon as we submit, consultation phase, determination, spring next year, all being well, and then commencement sort of almost immediately once we've got um, once we've got our planning consent. Okay, thank you to Simon. We've got a few more questions to come in, which we'll get to very shortly. Uh, the other thing I wanted to tell uh, people about today, Simon, is just an update about you. They've got to know you very well over the last couple of years, particularly by the Haven Thicket Reservoir Stakeholder Group. Uh, and the very sad news is um, you won't be part of the project uh, for, for, for much longer, very sadly. Well, thank you, Joel. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't about me. So um, just to say thank you to everybody on the call uh, and on the webinar for all your brilliant support that you've given, not just me, but all of my colleagues and my predecessors working on this project. I'm, I'm off to, um, to, to help find uh, a site for the UK's um, deep geological disposal facility for radioactive waste, which, um, you know, as I said, I, I enjoy a challenge. Um, 
say are doing much of the same thing, but um, I, I'm very ably uh, supported and handing over to uh, Malcolm, who you've, you, you've, you've just met. Um, Malcolm will be the project director and leading, but please do continue to come in through Joel for any questions or or day-to-day -day comments that you've got. And um, and I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you all uh, with a glass of uh, champagne at the uh, opening ceremony. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got a further few questions to get through before we close. Um, so one for you, Bob, that's coming from CM Burns, who just wants to know how's the project going to be financed? You talk about the, you know, the link up, the partnership with Southern Water there, but I guess um, Mr. Burns is just curious to know how it's actually going to stack up financial wise. Well, um, uh, the project is uh, the construction work, which is obviously a, a heavy spend of about £120 million pounds in the uh, early years of the project, is uh, is financed through uh, our owners, Portsmouth Waters owners, who will be putting uh, an equity contribution into that, but, but also from, uh, from lenders as well. We'd be borrowing money to do that. But then that... Um, uh, that financing is then repaid to Portsmouth by Southern Waters customers uh, over the uh, the duration of the contract. So um, uh, one of the important sort of regulatory principles of this project is that because uh, Southern Waters customers were largely going to be benefiting from the uh, the reservoir, then this this project would be paid for ultimately by Southern Waters water customers. Um, and not by Portsmouth Waters, and that is basically the principle. So, so we finance it up front as Portsmouth Water, but it's then reimbursed, if you like, over the period of uh, the contract for Southern to buy the water from us from the reservoir. Okay, thank you to Bob. And a question, Simon, back to Pat, um, still concerned about the, um, the trees that have been planted up on the site. And she asks, or he asks, a further question about the maintenance of young trees. What plans are there to water them during dry periods? So I know that, that yourself and Trevor said that it was important to get it right and to do it in the right way. But again, if we get another dry spell like we've had in, in recent months, what's the plan for looking after those young trees? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, and I, like you, I'll sort of really sad to see those um, those trees sort of struggling through what was an incredibly dry patch um, uh, earlier this year. I think there's probably a couple of things there. One is um, we, we took an active decision not to water those trees um, at a time when the message from water companies across the southeast was uh, save water, um, don't use your hose pipes, don't, um, don't uh, wash your car, and I think it was absolutely right that we followed exactly that guidance at the time. Um, I think uh, Trevor also just, just sort of alluded to the fact they were planted a little bit late in the season. And so in our planting of new trees going forward, I would also they were planted with uh, a lot of these sort of plastic tree uh, guards around them, which, um, which, which doesn't really help um, when they're stock fenced. So, um, you know, we, there are ways, there are lessons we've learned in terms of timing of planting and the type of planting that we'll do that hopefully will, well, we know it will remove, not entirely, but it will reduce the need for any sort of watering aftercare. We, in our, in our next stages of, of planting, we'll, we'll do what's called a, a, you know, a, a, an aftercare plan. And that will include ways in which we can find and secure water, which uh, doesn't have an impact on wider water supply. So if we do need to water them, we will. Um, but also we'll plant them at, at, a, at a better time and we'll um, put in place um, other measures to make sure that the, the need for watering is, is reduced as, a, a, as an overall principle as well. Okay, thank you to Simon. I've got a question in from Gary Robinson, I believe is, is a local councillor. I think also a cabinet member at Haven Borough Council. Uh, Bill, Bill, if you're still there, um, lead engineer for the project, it relates to the pipeline. So Gary's asking, how will the new pipe work, as in the pipeline to, to, to fill and empty the reservoir, impact the pressure and flow of the mains water in the local area? And am I right in thinking there's no link between that pipe work and, and, and the wider network directly? Um, uh, that's correct. For the, um, So the, the pipeline that's connecting um, the reservoir, so the, um, the pipe that we're using to, to fill the reservoir and then ultimately um, provide the water down into um, 
the raw water down to um, down to our treatment works. Uh, it is on a raw water system, so um, it is totally segregated from uh, from the main supply to to customers' taps. So so you won't. Um, uh, experience any uh, impact uh, in terms of uh, the water uh, you tap for that. Um, we do obviously need to um, get the water across to to Southern uh, and any sort of connections that um, that are provided for that uh, are principally on the trunk main system. So again, there's um, a degree of separation away from um, the, the, the distribution network um, and uh, the point at which um, you know you're, you're uh, turning your tap on. So so um, yeah, we're continuing to provide uh, the levels of service that um, that you used to um, and that Portsmouth has you know the uh, um, making the commitment to to provide to you. Okay and, and Bob the, the reason that Gary's asking that question is that he seems to have noticed a, a reduction in pressure recently so I guess the message to him would be if there are problems then to, to let you guys at Portsmouth Water know and it may well be again with the issues that there's been with you know high demand that the pressure in pressure in the network um, you know can vary when there's when there's high demand and people are filling paddling pools or whatever they might be doing yeah i mean we have as i said earlier we have seen some um high demand not so much just recently but certainly um going back into um into august we have seen some very high demand and and frankly it has been challenging to to get water through our network to uh where customers need it at their taps and so on um, because as and as water moves through our, our pipe network, you know the pressure does reduce. So uh, I, th I think we we have had a, a sort of a handful of problems with people suffering low pressure because they're at the very end of the system um, typically, and we can usually uh, make some adjustments to the system to um, to recover that. But uh, I think as as Bill has said, this system. That we are putting in for the reservoir is 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 a, what we call a raw water system. It's an untreated water system. The reservoir will contain untreated water directly from the springs, and then from the springs we take it to one of our existing treatment works at Funtington, and uh, not Funtington, Farlington. Sorry, different F, Farlington, and um, there it is treated to potable standard, and then it is transported to the delivery point to Southern, which is uh, at our River Itchin treatment work. So, and that is into our treated water system, but those are the, the large trunk mains. Um, there shouldn't be any impact on your pressures as a result of that. But I mean, pr pressure throughout the day, you know, um, pressures do change, um, you know, in the evening time or, or first thing in the morning when people are getting up, showering, having a breakfast, you know, pressures do reduce. And then as, as demand drops off, pressures increase again. So there are, there are what we call diurnal variations over 24 hours. There are also variations between different times of the year. That's simply the, um, the laws of hydraulics. And um, whilst we to, do to try to influence and manage that by removing excessive pressures that only go to burst our pipes and cause interruptions, um, what we aim to do is to try and keep the pressures as constant as we possibly can throughout our network because our network is a bit of an old lady in some areas you know you're talking about Victorian infrastructure older infrastructure and in order to be kind to that infrastructure the way it responds best is to try and keep the pressures uh, as consistent and as flat as possible so yeah you may have seen some short duration um, uh, changes in pressure particularly in the evenings perhaps in the longer hot evenings or first thing in the, in the morning uh, over the recent hot weather but things should be should be more normal now I would have thought and if that's not the case then please let us know. Okay thank you for all your questions that have come in and uh, thank you for bearing with us through the technical problems that we had which we'll get to the bottom of so if you are getting issues with sound I will send around a link so you can access the recording of the webinar and listen back to it uh, in good quality sound if you are having problems but hopefully it didn't disturb uh, too many people too much. Let's close with our normal uh, ending poll so again it's just uh, capturing your views on our proposals for Haven't Thicket Reservoir. Now you've heard about the updates to them and also those um, sound problems notwithstanding how useful you found the webinar. So again I'll give people a few seconds to fill those in. Uh, I will send round uh, uh, an email with the link to the video in it uh, and further information to the you said we did feedback report that's on the 
Haven't Thicket website. So it's portsmouthwater.co.uk forward slash haven't dash thicket dash reservoir. If I could just ask the panel members to pop up on camera. Apologies for not involving everyone today uh, originally as planned, but we had lots of questions to get through. So thanks for being on hand in case. And I think also as well, a few questions were answered by answers being typed back as well. So that's, that's good to hear. So let's uh, end the polling there. Give people just a couple more seconds to, to fill in their answers and share the results. So in terms of support, well, it's um, really they're OK upwards in terms of people's views on the proposals. So 44% uh, think they're great. Another 44% think they're good. And a couple of people think they're OK. And then in terms of how useful the webinar has been, again, a lot of people positive about it. Um, it's been excellent with 38%. It's been good 44%. It's been OK 19%. But again, uh, I'll be in touch about those um, sound issues if you had them just to get to the bottom of them and make sure they don't happen again. So many thanks to the panel members for their contributions today. We'll again be in touch with you over the coming weeks as we're preparing to put the planning applications in and also uh, probably in all likelihood, uh, given um, the coronavirus situation, running further online events to engage with you in the months ahead. But thank you for joining us today and we'll leave you to enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much and until next time.